A very good evening to you all. I pray you've had a good day so far. And as we wind down, we want to gather again around the Word of God to allow God's Word to speak to us before we retire. Uh, today, I know that the Black Stars are playing, so let us keep them in our prayers, uh, whether you like football or not. Uh, so we we'll spend the next one hour, as we always do, pondering over the Word of God. Today, I am doing most of the talking, and it's because of the thing I want us to do today. I'm looking at the structure of the Bible, and... Well, as it comes to the structure of the Bible, it's a little bit technical, but I've tried to make it as simple as we can all, so that we can all enjoy the discussion or the, the teaching for today. And we want to begin with, with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed the fruit of your own Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Almighty our living God, we gather because of your word, which brings us together as your sons and daughters. And we pray that your word, that we try to look at the structure today, we will and the experience that the Holy Spirit brings, that this discussion will lead us to appreciate your word and how your word has been shaped throughout the centuries. And through understanding, continue to ponder upon the word that feeds our souls and nourishes our bodies. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. I want to believe you can hear me. Can I get a high to see that you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So once again, I want to thank you for making last week's discussion so special, so enjoyable. Uh, I sent out a PDF for the quotations, hopefully, or the quotations of uh, that we churned out. And I did that so that we can all have enough quotes to walk by no matter the situation that comes our way as we go through this year. And I mentioned that the structure we are following between now and then the end of Lent is that we want to now look at the structure of the Bible. And so I'm taking the Old Testament today, and then next Wednesday, next Monday, we'll do the, the New Testament. And the rationale is that having read Genesis, now let's see how the Old Testament itself is all about. You know, so today that is what I want us to do. And I begin with a quote from Dei Verbum. Dei Verbum is one of the documents of Vatican II, which is referred to as a dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. So Dei Verbum is word of God, Latin, Dei, God, in the genitive, verbum, word, right? So, the verbum word of God. And I'm quoting from paragraph 11 of that document, which I'm putting on the chat page. The paragraph 11 of that document. And it says that those divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in sacred scripture have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For Holy Mother Church, relying on the belief of the apostles, holds that the books of both the Old and New Testament in their entirety with all their parts are sacred and canonical because written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself. In composing the sacred books, God chose men, and while employing, while employed by him, they made use of their powers and abilities, 
so that with him acting in them and through them, they as true authors consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. Let, let me take it again and read along. That is why I, I pasted it there, read along. And you get to appreciate the beauty of the uh, language at play that is communicating to us the importance of the Bible, of the Word of God, and what we are going to do today. So those divinely revealed realities which are contained and presented in sacred scripture have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. For Holy Mother Church, relying on the belief of the apostles, holds that the books of both the Old and New Testament in their entirety, taken together collectively and also in their parts, if you pick them one by one, are sacred and canonical because written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such to the church herself. In composing the sacred books, God chose men and while employed by him, they made use of their powers and abilities so that with him acting in them and through them, they as true authors consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. So the main point I, I want to flag from this quotation is that once you are looking at the Bible, I mean, the Bible, as you know, is a collection of books, Ta Biblia, is a collection of books, a library of books. But collectively, they communicate a message of redemption. Individually, in their parts also, we consider each book as sacred and as authoritative, canonical, authoritative. Authoritative because they were all written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So why God would use men, why God used people to write the stories, because they were employed by him, even though they would use their natural powers and abilities, ultimately, what they were writing were things that God wanted to be written. That is what the church wants us to appreciate and reflect upon. So when you take any book of the Bible, you have that at the back of your mind that God will use human beings, but will use them in a way that carries a message that he wants to communicate. Now, having that understanding at the back of our minds, we now look at the Old Testament. How many books make up the Old Testament? Just type your answer, so or meet yourself and, and talk. How many books make up the Old Testament? 46. 46? 46. How many books? Any other answer? Forty six. Any other answer? 39. So that itself set the stage for a discussion for this evening. Some will say 39, some will say 46. Right? 39 if you're using the Hebrew Bible. And what I have in my hands is a typical Jewish study Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Uh, so if you have this, then your answer will be 39. If you are using the public Bible, that will be 46. I'm hoping that by the end of the teaching today, I would come to why we have that difference. So if you take the Old Testament, what we call the Hebrew canon, canon here meaning authoritative, the rule, the measure. The... Jewish Bible, the Hebrew canon, divides the Bible into three. You have the Torah or the Pentateuch. The prophets, 
the second one, and the writing. So you have the Pentateuch, the prophets, and the writings. All in the Hebrew, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Those are the three main parts of the Bible, according to the Hebrew canon. Other translations will group the Bible differently, but I'm sticking to this for our discussion. When we talk of the Torah, how many books are there? The first five books, and let's see if we can collect, we can recollect what those five books are. What are they? Genesis, we all read Genesis, good. Genesis up there. The next one is? Exodus. Correct. And then? Leviticus. Leviticus, we are making progress. Numbers. And lastly? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Great. So the first five books of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, sometimes referred to as the five books of Moses. But scholarship has, has um, given reasons why we can say Moses wrote all of them. One of them, for instance, is that Moses records his own death, you know. Uh, so if you take all those instances, they say that no, Moses couldn't have written the books himself, but they're attributed to him, you know. Now, what are the main highlights of the books of this part of scripture? The most important thing I want you to recollect and keep in mind each time you look at the Torah, the first five books of Moses, right? The first five books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, is that you will see in it the will of God. It's like it's so many things at once. The will of God is at play. And this particular is that the will of God for Israel is at play. You see also a promise that God will make to Abraham and his descendants. You will see an outline of the facts concerning the people of God. You will see things about worship, about calls, how to worship the Holy One. Then also, paradigmatically, you are going to see something about the story of human rebellion and God's plan of redemption. So these characteristics are found in the Torah, in the Pentateuch. The will of God for Israel, the promise, the facts about the future of the people of God, how to worship God as the Holy One, and the story of human rebellion and divine redemption. So for instance, you look at Genesis 1 to 11, where you get to see the foundation story. You look at creation, the creation account which we discussed. Then you see how after the creation account, we have the disobedience of man in Genesis 11, setting the stage for the story of Abraham and the patriarchs. And by the time Abraham is leaving the stage, um, uh, in, in, you see Joseph coming up. So the patriarchs will form their story. And then in Genesis 50, when Joseph is dying, he would indicate to them that the Lord will lead the sons of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. And that sets the stage for the second book where Exodus comes in. The theme of holiness is very central to the discussions in Leviticus. So every book would have a theme, but they are all shaping up to what makes the five books of Moses central to Israel's history. Holiness, one of the major themes. So if you come into Leviticus, you'll see all the laws that were given, but all of them will center around God saying to them in Leviticus 19 verse 2, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. So the call to holiness is that which is conceived and put into practice in various laws and rituals. Also that the people of God can be who God wants them to be, a people called to a life of holiness. 
grisly people, killing people, God's chosen people. So, once you look at it that way, then that becomes a reason why when you are reading Leviticus, even though some of the laws are not laws we are obeying now, you get to understand why those laws will be important to the community at the time. So basically, when we are talking about the old Hebrew canon, we should remember that there are three parts. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketubim. Pentateuch, prophets, and writings. If you talk about the Torah, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. What are the things that you will see in this book? You are going to see foundational stories, something about creation, going through human rebellion. Then it will set the stage for the patriarchs. Abraham and the Jacob will all come in. By the time Joseph is leaving the scene, how he ends the story will set the stage for the story of the Exodus. Relating with God, how do you get to understand the nature of God? That comes clearly, not only on Sinai, but even in that whole story of Leviticus. You know, where the laws and all those are fleshed out and that with the understanding that the people are called to a life of holiness. How do you live it out? That is where the laws and the rituals all come in. You know, so then the book of Numbers will also reinforce, especially the first part, will reinforce how the Israelites need to be able to travel through the wilderness with the sanctuary, with the tent in the armies, as a people have been set apart by Yahweh. So put all this together, and then you'll understand why in the beginning I said that the Torah would communicate the will of God for Israel. It communicates the promise. It communicates the fact about the future of the people of God. It communicates the way to worship God. It communicates understanding that worshiping God means recognizing Him as the Holy One. And it also communicates to us the story of human rebellion and God's plan to redeem humanity again. Now that said, we transition to the book on the second major part. That is the prophets. Please, as I go along, if you have questions, kindly type them in the chat page. So the second major division is the prophets. And here it starts from Joshua through Judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and what we consider as the 12 minor prophets. Anytime, anytime we talk about the anytime we talk about the book of the I see a question whether the Leviticus was targeted at the Levites. Not only them, but the whole people as the people as a whole. That is why you have rituals for almost everything in the in the in the book. Great. So we go to the the prophets. So we have Judges, Joshua, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and the 12 minor prophets. If you hear the term minor prophets, it is not used in the sense of that they were less important. They, they were less important. But it is used in the sense of the fact that their works are short. So you look at Amos, a few chapters, Hosea, a few chapters, 
That's the reason why they are referred to as the minor prophets. Now, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings are referred to as former prophets. And then Isaiah through the latter ones are all referred to as the, 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 the and Isaiah through the 12 are called the latter prophets. The reason is this. If you look at the stories of Joshua, Judges, Samuel, Kings, apart from having the prophetic ministry being exercised there, there's a sense in which it's more like a historic account of events. So it's not surprising that some translations or some divisions will refer to those as historical books. But in the Jewish canon, in the Jewish division of the Bible, they are seen as part of the prophetic tradition. Because also in those books, you have the account of the prophets, even if not at the same as you would find in the, in the other ones. So in non-Jewish Bibles, you will find them as historical prophets, as historical uh, books. But here we are looking at it from the understanding that these are former prophets. Yes, for so the, those of you who are wondering whether we're going to come to the 40s, remember I mentioned at the beginning that the, there's a reason why, one reason why I have the discussion. So I'm treating what you will find in all Bibles first. Then I will transition to why we Catholics have uh, the 46 books. So I will come to that before we end our discussions today. Thank you. And thanks for the, the questions from uh, Mary Magdalene and, and then Judith. We'll definitely touch on that. So the minor prophets, like I mentioned, you when we come to the prophets, it's also important to note that we will Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel are usually referred to as major prophets in some literature. And it's also because of the volume of their work. That is primarily the reason why, you know. Another reason would be the time in which they, they ministered. And then the 12 minor prophets, uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nehum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zachariah, and Malachi, whom I have put out on the chat page. It is instructive to note that with the exception of Jonah, if you look at the minor prophet, with the exception of Jonah, they all contain collection of oracles. All of them have certain oracle that God will speak publicly to the Israelites. And the most famous one is one from which if you take the book of Amos. You see Amos will declare an oracle over an oracle over an oracle for the excess of four and then five, then you will come out against them, lashing them against the kind of um, practices that were going on, you know. So let me recap the prophetic side, just for us to get some clarity there. Once you talk about the prophets, we are starting from the books from Joshua, including the judges, including judges, Samuel, Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets, which I have put out there on the chat page. You can divide them into former prophets and later prophets. Former prophets are the books of Joshua. Judges, Samuel, Kings. And then you can also do the other latter prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 minor prophets. If you take the latter prophets, you can divide them into two, major prophets and minor prophets. And the major prophets are Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and... Um, Isaiah, and the minor ones are uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, and the rest of them. But like I said, the division is not about, it's, it's more in terms of the, 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 the number of pages, the, 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 the sense of their minor ones being shot, you know. 
So it's not as if that they, they didn't have, uh, you are downgrading their importance in the history, but it is about differentiating, differentiating what they did. One of the things that the prophets would always do is that they would always call the people to repentance. And even more so, even more so, they would then now look at the idea of God intervening in the historical events. And once God intervenes in the historical events, it means that there's going to be transformation of the conditions of the life of the Israelites. So if you pick Isaiah, you will hear statements such that God is about to do something new. Do you perceive it? Do you see it? Right. So all those instances, look at the value of the dry bones in, in, in Ezekiel. You know, Jeremiah said that the plans I have for you are peace and not, uh, uh, not disaster. All those instances are communicating God's dramatic intervention in the historical conditions of his people, in the historical events of his people, and how he will now transform the conditions of their lives. So it's one of the major themes that you find in the prophetic literature. How about the third major division? The third major division, we have what we call the writings. And usually you would see that if you pick any Bible, you will find the writings will begin with the Psalms. Some may follow it up with Proverbs and then Job. Others will do Job first and then Proverbs. But the Psalms always begin the writings. And after that will then come the five smaller books, also called the five scrolls. Now the song of songs, you have Ruth, you have Lamentation, you have Ecclesiastes, you have Esther. You know, so... The first session, is composed of the three larger books, Proverbs, Job, Psalm, but always Psalms will begin. Then you have the five smaller ones, the Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentation, Ecclesiastes, and then Esther. Then the last one will be Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. So again, if you take the writings or the Ketuvim, there are three parts. You have the first session, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, or Psalms, Job, Proverbs. But Psalms will always start. Now you have the five smaller books, which are Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentation, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. Then you have Daniel, Ezra, and Nehemiah, and then Chronicles. If you take these writings, you will not find a central theme as you will find in the Torah, which has the idea of the land of promise as its fulfillment, its center. Right. Or if you took the prophet's little picture as a whole, you can see the importance of heeding to the media, to the word, and what it means and the consequence of the history of the people. Once you come to the writings, they, you'll find a number of literature, and what they basically do is to, either it's a prayer like you have in the Psalms, Proverbs trying to help us, you know, live good lives by just giving us practical instructions, Job helping us to understand that one of the major problems of human nature, 
why do good people suffer? The whole question of theodicy comes into play in the book of Job. And then lamentation, Ecclesiastes, Esther. You can't put the two, all of them together and look for a single theme as you can with the other books of the Bible. But the important thing for us, once we look at this division, is that, again, going back to the quotation that I started with in the beginning, that these divinely revealed realities, which are contained and presented in sacred scripture, have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if you take the Torah, if you take the writings, if you take the uh, prophets, all these have been committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And if you take either each book, either in its entirety with all its parts, they are all sacred and canonical because written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they have God as their author and have been handed on as such the church itself. So that will, if you add, do all the mathematics involved, you will see that you will have 39 books. And that is the, again, the Jewish canon, the Hebrew canon. So if you pick this Bible, you will find that you only have the books I have listed divided according to this order. So why do we have the 46? for Catholics. And Judith, like you said, you can even have more than 46. And I will explain why. Why do we have the 46? First of all, note that up to the Reformation, up to the Council of Trent, the Church had accepted the 46 books. There is something that we call a Dietrich canonical books. But the Hebrew canon is 39. But the church also found books which they have believed to be divinely inspired and has been there since the beginning in the intertestamental period. And because of that, the church held on that, look, the, the, the qualifications, the rules that were used to select books as part of the tradition of the divinely revealed word applies to these books. And so it was part of the church's tradition and at the Council of Trent, which was the 16th century, they were made definitive that this is part of our heritage. So you can imagine that the then Christian world all who used that book, the Bible with 46 books, we're all that we're all using. It was all that we're all using. Now, with the Reformation, Martin Luther and his people decided that they were rejecting, they were just going by the Hebrew canon. So what we call the true canonical, second canon, because the Hebrew canon is the first canon, the first rule, the first selected books, and then with tradition, the second literal canonical books were accepted. What we call literal canonical, they call apocrypha, hidden, you know, something that is also to be accepted. So from that point onwards, you will see that the Protestants don't have those books in their Bibles. That is the major reason. So what we refer as Dietro Canonical, the second canon, they view it as not being divinely inspired. So you can say that the Jews and the Protestants are on the same angle when it comes to those books. But the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox Christians, we consider them as inspired. So we have held on to that teaching and to that belief that Dietro canonical with the second canon, Dietro, like Deuteronomy, you know, the second book, so the second canon is also divinely inspired. And the Council of Trent in 1546 made it definitive. So if the Protestants don't have it, it's because Luther and their leaders rejected the Catholic canon and then said that they were going to stick with the Hebrew canon. So what are those books? 
like Judith said, I mean, you can find more than, there are more than six, that there are more than seven. However, if you make them, so let me put the books out there. You can see that there are even 12 of them. So you have Tobit, Judith, Baduk, Serak, writings of Ben Serak, first Maccabees, second Maccabees, third Maccabees, fourth Maccabees, wisdom, prayer of Manasseh, one Esdras, two Esdras. If you put Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Serak, all the books of Maccabees together, uh, Ecclesiastes, the prayer of Manasseh books and the Chronicles, one and two Esdras, you will have seven books. And then you get a 46. Tobit 1, Judith 2, Baruch 3, Sirach 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Maccabees will become 5. Wisdom is 6. Prayer of Manasseh goes and the Chronicles. 1 and 2 Esdras, then you get the 6, the, the 7. You add it to 39, and you have 46. Is that part clear? Let me go over why we have a Catholic Bible and why you should buy a Catholic Bible and why you should read the digital canonical books. Let me take it again. So the Hebrew canon, which is the first canon, the first agreed canon has 90, 39 books. However, there are other books which are also considered or considered divinely inspired. And those were the seven additional ones which were accepted. Remember, when we said all scripture is inspired, it's used for the, the quotation in 2 Timothy 3.16. It's used for correction, improving character, that a man of God will lack no, no virtue. The same qualifications that were used for the first canon apply to those books as well and were considered as being divinely revealed. Keep in mind the quotation we had at the beginning. God using human beings to communicate what is eternal, what is he wants us to, to know. And the church at the time, there was one church, remember, Holy Catholic Apostolic Church. That was the only church had accepted those Deuteronomy canonical books, the books of Tobit, Judith, Baruch, Serach, uh, Maccabees, Wisdom, and the prayer of Manasseh, and then Ezra had accepted them and were using them. At the Council of Trent, these were further examined and accepted as part of the heritage of the church. But Luther and the Protestants decided that those books were not divinely inspired. And rather, they would stick with the Hebrew canon, the 39 books, the first canon. So that is the reason why we have the Black Bible and the other Bibles. In other words, the Bibles don't, which you don't have the book. So whenever you are buying a Bible, either for yourself or for a child or for a friend, it's important to get look at the contents. Sometimes they will write it at the spine of the book that it has digital canonical books. Like what we call digital canonical, they call it apocrypha. They don't want to have anything to, to do with, with that. Um, Sadie is saying that Father it seems we usually hear readings from Tobit. Sirach, Maccabees, and Wisdom more. Why aren't the other stories of the, of the others usually heard? Maybe I'll come to this very soon. The other point I want you to note is that there are also parts even of, of, of the stories in, in the canon, the Hebrew canon, that we, that's the, 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 in the development of biblical literature, you have stories which you will find in the um, Hebrew canon, which you will find in the Catholic Bible. 
I don't know, at one of the programs, I'm trying to remember which one, when we read the story of, of Daniel, you'd recall that in one of the, in some of the Bibles, those of you who are using the uh, African, African Community Bible, there were more details in it about how the, the angel came into the furnace and then pushed the heat out and all that, that they were having, they felt cool uh, at the time and there was no fire really burning them. Those are details that you will find only in Catholic Bibles. What do I mean? So if you are thinking of the Deuteronomical books as a block, we have them. But there are also additions to three books which are accepted in the Bible canon, in the first canon. So you find those additions, for instance, in the book of Esther, in the book of Daniel, and in the Psalms. The Psalm Bibles in the Psalms, you see Psalm 151, which you won't find in other Bibles. So the one Psalm 151 is only found in the Catholic Bible. If you go into the book of Daniel, you will see the story of Susanna, the Jewish woman who was falsely accused of adultery, but was acquitted by Daniel. You will find that story there. And like I mentioned, the story of the, of the priest sung by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when we were inside the furnace, you will find it there. You also find the story in Daniel chapter 12, Bell and the Dragon, the two stories which condemn idolatry, you will find them there. These are stories that you won't find in a typical Hebrew Bible or what the Protestants use, you know. So flag that as well. Then the story of Esther you will find certain details and the prayer of Mordecai and Esther, the text of the edict that was given, you know, and the verses one and two of chapter five would not, would not also be found in other Bibles. In other words, in other words, our Bible has more. And whatever is there is believed to be divinely inspired and is useful for helping us as we journey towards salvation. So, if you hear that we have more books of the Bible, that is because when it got to the 16th century, during the Protestant Reformation, Luther and his people decided to let go of the Catholic canon, or the, the, the canon we were using at the time, and to stick to the Hebrew canon. And what we call this true canonical, the second canon, which is part of the original Hebrew canon, they consider as apocrypha, you know, something that they don't have really to do with, to do with. So we have those books, the seven books, which when divided can go like 12. But you also have passages which are part of the Hebrew canon, which you won't find because we have the in the, the tradition has added this to them because they were available. But we're not including it because it's something that they crafted out of their own wishes. No, these were schools which were later found and therefore were tied to what was available or what had been accepted at the time. So the three areas that you find that happening will be the book of Esther, the book of Daniel, and the Psalms. And the Psalms, the typical one is Psalm 151. That is where it happens, only Psalm 151. But if you go to the book of Daniel, the story of Susanna is not in the Jewish canon, right? You have the prayers of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, also not there. Bell and the dragon, you won't find it in the Hebrew canon. Then Esther's example that I, I have given. Now let me pick up a question which um, came up. Sadie is asking, it seems we usually hear readings from Tobit, Sirach, Maccabees, and wisdom more. You're right. Wisdom, particularly, uh, Maccabees, particularly, even at a funeral sometime, right? If you're looking at why we pray for the dead, we fall into the into, into Maccabees. Oh, yes. Another reason why the reformers let go of the of the traditional, or what we call the Tocanical books, is that they also felt that it gave us room to justify some of the things that they were against. 
for instance, praying for the dead, issues like purgatory and those things. It's like that is one area that we, we will find, we find our, our, our references. And those were things that we're not comfortable with. And therefore, if we let go of those books, then obviously there won't be any justification for us to preach those things. So keep that also, also in mind. One of the reasons why we, we have that, that, that departure in terms of how many books or what kind of books should be in the, in the, in the Bible. So we hear from Tobit, yes, Sirach more, also because the, the readings, as, as you know, are chosen, especially the, the, the first readings, are chosen to, ref, to flesh out some aspect of the gospel reading. So it's unfortunate that we, can't, we don't cover every, every part of the, of the Bible. And that is why discussions like this are important to, to supplement what we don't hear publicly. And that is why if I were you, you would also want to even begin to read more of those books which you don't hear about more, right? As a way of filling in, in the gap. But if you don't hear of them, it's just because of the structure of the mass and how the readings are chosen. It's not because some of them are, are, not, are not important, right? So hopefully, with our discussions here and there, we'll be able to come to, to some of these questions with time. Now, let me ask, do we have any general questions? I know that today it's been more like me giving out the, the topic, but it's, it's supposed to be like this for today and then for, for next uh, week. Then we will yeah, I had a question. Oh, sorry. Yes, yes, you're sweet. You said there are 151 psalms. I, I, there was the Psalm 151. Um, but I thought there were only 150 psalms. And also, I wanted to know what was in Psalm 151. So, if you go into the the division of the of the psalms, when we come to that, you will see that at certain points the psalms will dovetail into two. Some parts are clarified, classified as two two parts. Okay. Yes. And that's how come you will end up with some 151 in some in some Bibles. Okay. Okay. And what was in Psalm 151 that you mentioned? So sorry. Okay. Yeah, so it's a, uh, I'm trying to retrieve it for you. Okay. Let me ask the Psalm of David, Jesus son, I was the smallest of my brother, the youngest of my father's sons. He made me a shepherd of his flock, ruler over their young. My mind, my hands made a flute, my fingers a liar. Let me give glory to the Lord, I thought to myself. So even if you Google it, Psalm 151, you would you would find it. I just type into Google. Oh, okay. It. Yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Some Bibles. It's it's like David singing his, his praises and the praises to God for him being chosen and uh, God anointing him making him a leader to rule by the people. That okay. That's what about, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, let's say now. Yes, please. Please, but the Psalm 151 is not even in the Catholic Bible. So, the, some, the if you go into the, the Greek text, I think has it. So, if you don't find it there in this in the Bible that we have. I think if you go online, it is provided as part of the heritage of the church. So I wanted to mention that. So that if you hear it somewhere, it's not like ah, we've never, we've never heard of it before. Do you get my point? Yes, brother. Yes, please. So please look at the digital technical by the, the books. They are very rich, very, very, very rich. I mean, if you go into Ben Sirah, you'll find enough piece of advice as you'll find in Proverbs and even more. You know, uh, Book of Maccabees, you see how people as were zealous for for the Lord and how they communicated their zealousness to the point that they got the the um so generally even with the New Testament the 
the historical closing of the canon, usually it comes at uh, like, like the 70 AD one was at Jamia, right? It is not something that anybody can add to it now currently. The canon was closed. Like, they are, if we come to the New Testament, for instance, I would, I would, I would answer this question better for you, but when we come next week, because for instance, you have Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Thomas. So how come you only kept four gospels, right? We look at the criteria which was used and why certain aspects. Even have the Gospel of uh, of uh, of, of, John, of uh, like I mentioned Judas and I've mentioned uh, Thomas. You will, you will see why certain books were rejected and why certain uh, others were kept. We can talk about this next week when we pick up the, the New Testament. Yes, so... Mary Magdalene, you're right. The good news also doesn't have it. Where is my good, my good news? Yeah, also doesn't have But like I said, I wanted to point, put out the full information out there. So I guess in case you come across a Bible which has that, then it's not like, hey, where is this? But like you know that this is also that is considered as a, a biblical text. So let's bring in our prayer requests. And we've said a lot today. But thankfully, we also have the recording, and so we can go back to it and then play it and see the divisions of the, of the Bible as we find in the Hebrew canon. And then you also now know why we have more than they have and some of the reasons which are counted to the everything changed from the Reformation. And at the time that we're all one, we're following the... Bible, which are the, both the usual canonical books and the Hebrew canon. We want to pray for ourselves. We want to pray for God's protection, guidance, and blessings on Mr. Datsun and the children for Samuel and Antoinette, for strength in faith and good health, for peace and unity in families, for divine healing, for divine healing. We want to ask God for his protection for every one of you, for the blessings bestowed upon Priest's family for divine mercy of our families, for peace of mind, for God's blessings of the work of our hands. For Robert and Andrew and Ephra for divine mercies, for health, for closeness to God, for new beginnings for the university students, for all priests and religious. We pray that the Father of mercies will increase our faith. And then as we pray for our special intentions, and these are intentions, like I say, I carry them in my heart. I carry them to our Blessed Mother when we pray. Almighty ever living God, we want to thank you for our discussions today that led us to the structure of the Bible. We thank you for our heritage, our heritage as Catholics, which includes both canonical and deuterocanonical books. Father, may your word continue to strengthen us, even as we walk with you and listen to our prayers. The prayers we are asking for good health, we are asking for divine blessings, we are asking for restoration, we are asking for your blessings upon the work we do. We are asking for peace of mind. We are asking for your presence in the life of all students. We are asking that you bless our youth. We are asking that even as we put these intentions before you, we also acknowledge your faithfulness and your love. So Father, have mercy upon us. Bless us. Keep us together. And continue to be our shepherd. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. 
So before we leave, let us all remember that we are having the prayer clinic for our our youth, our children between the ages of 5 and 15. And we want parents and grandparents and adults of the parish to be invested in this, in this program. And also to signal that at the beginning of February, we would be doing the Novena to St. Joseph, entrusting into the hands of God the all the work that we, we do. Mm -hmm. that as we go through the year, St. Joseph, who is both a uh, husband and father and a patron of mm -hmm. workers, We'll, we'll, we'll make sure that God will bless the work of our hands mm -hmm. and also help us to, to receive more blessings, more mm -hmm. insights, more um, encouragement. Because sometimes mm -hmm. we labor and labor, we don't see results. Mm -hmm. We want to ask St. Mm -hmm. Joseph to be our help and our guide. And that is what we are going to do from the 1st of February to the mm -hmm. 9th of February. Mm -hmm. uh, we are committing our year to the hands of St. Joseph. The Lord be with you. Thank you. Oh, your spirit. The mighty God. Your spirit. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you. Good night, everyone. Oh, Have a you, nice Father. evening. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.